I am right now doing topical sermons till we, in August we'll pick up and we're going to study the book of Matthew uh, with vacations and all that's going on. Uh, we are just uh, kind of waiting for the series to start there. Uh, so today, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. I want to talk to you today about the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. You know, and when I think about that, uh, you, you are talking about a man that lived here 33 years and never sinned one time. And when I think of that kind of mind, uh, that is the mind that I need in my personal life. Uh, that is the mind I need to emulate. Uh, that is the way of thinking uh, that I need to change. Uh, because there are people that think you cannot change your way of thinking, but folks, you can. With God's help, you can change your way of thinking. And let me give you the outline. It's in your bulletin if you want to follow along with us. Number one, the mind of love. The mind of Christ is the mind of love. He is love. Jesus showed love. Number two, a mind of humility. A mind of humility. And uh, this is not showing much in our world today. Everybody be, wants to be number one. Everybody, you know, uh, entitlement is a word uh, that I see happening all around in our society. And we as Christians need to be humble. And the third thing is a mind of obedience. Obedience. The Word of God clearly says uh, He obeyed His heavenly Father, and we need to do the same. You know, there are many factors that determine, determine how a person thinks. How you were raised is a factor. Your church background is a fa factor. Your education is a factor. Your self-esteem is a factor. And your friends is a factor. Your friends influence you more than we want to uh, admit. And folks, we have to be careful. Teenagers especially, listen to me. You need to be careful on who you befriend. Okay, we need Christian friends. And we need, and, and I'm not saying you can't hang around lost friends. I'm simply saying they do not need to influence you in a negative way. I believe with all my heart, the greatest challenge you have in your Christian life is to change your way of thinking to line up uh, with the way God wants you to think. Jesus and the Holy Spirit in your, is in your heart but the true battle is in your mind. The key is having the mind of Christ. Jesus had three attributes in his life that will really help us be more like him in our thinking. I pray that you will let the Word of God sink deeply into your heart and change your mind to be more like Jesus in your way of thinking. And remember, folks, attitude is everything. Attitude is everything. So let's look at the mind of Christ. Philippians 2 verse 1, therefore, and what therefore means is, what is he talking about? He has talked about before, and uh, verse 21 is the summation, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Okay, and folks, Christians, we ought to believe that. We ought to practice that. Our whole life when we get saved, when we invite Jesus into our life, should be to please God and Jesus. Therefore, if there be any consolation in Christ, and you will see four ifs here, okay? An if could mean uh, either because, uh, you know, or since. Either of those words could, uh, could be put in there. Uh, any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love. If any fellowship of spirit, if any affection and mercy. And folks, all these are the things that Jesus showed in his life, okay? Uh, consolation uh, has to do with concern for people who are suffering, okay? And listen, folks, God and Jesus knows when we are going through suffering. And, you know, sometimes it's just life, folks. It's just life. And it says, if any comfort of love, Jesus loved everybody unconditionally. Did not matter who it was. Did not matter what race they were. 
their economic background. Doesn't matter if they were tax collectors who were are pretty much hated even back in Jesus' days. Jesus loved everyone he came in contact with. If any fellowship of the Spirit. And folks, the Spirit is the key to having uh, your right way of thinking. To have in Christ's mind, you must walk in the Spirit. If you do not, Romans tells us, walk in the Spirit, you will live after the flesh. And it says, if any affection and mercy, and affection is another word for love, and we know mercy is God having mercy on our soul. And you have to realize that God loved you so much that he sent his son to die for you. Jesus loved you so much that he went to a cross for you. And I will say this, folks, God's love and Jesus' love is the highest form of love there is. And we need that in our minds, okay? Folks, there is so much hate in this world today. All these shootings that are going on, all these things that are uh, in crimes and everything, it's just pure hate, all right? And I believe with all my heart, Satan knows his time is about finished, and he is doing everything that he can to cause havoc in the world, and I am telling you, hate is behind much of that. And it says, verse 2, fulfill my joy by being like-minded having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. So folks, we should, if we have the mind of Christ, live in that realm of joy. Folks, there's the difference between happiness and joy. Happiness deals with our circumstances. And I'm telling you, joy comes from within. And when you dwell on God's love for you, folks, It should produce joy in your life. And having the same love, being of one in cord and one mind. And again, I believe Paul is speaking to the Philippian church. And obviously there were some things going on there. And there were some divisions going on there. And folks, even in our church, folks, we have to guard against Satan and his attacks. He wants to divide us. He wants us talking about one another. He wants that word hate to come in. And folks, there is no room for hate in a Christian's life and in church life. Folks, of all people, Galatians says, we should love our brothers and sisters in Christ. So here we can see Jesus had the mind of love. 1 John 4, hold your finger there and go with me to 1 John 4. 1 John 4, verse 12. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. Folks, he's telling us we need to love one another. We need to love others. And I understand there are some folks that are hard to love. All right? But you don't pick and choose who you love and you don't love. We need to show God's love to everyone. We need to treat everyone the way God would treat them. And it says, his love has been perfected in us. How is it being perfected? By uh, living like Jesus. What would Jesus do? Folks, I'm telling you, he would love. All right? And and the mind of love was what he had. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. His Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. We don't have to, well, I wonder if I sinned. You You should know that. The conviction of the Holy Spirit, when you're hateful to someone, when you talk about someone, all right, when you're unfair and 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 you have attitudes towards people, folks, that is not God's love. Verse 14, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides him in him and he in God. He's talking about Christians. 
John is talking about Christians. And we have known and believe that the, lo- the, uh, the love of, that God has for us, we believe in the love that God has for us. And here's three times in this chapter, this statement is made, God is love. And we have to realize God and Jesus, folks, they are part of the Trinity. And if they love everybody unconditionally, we need to show people that love also. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Folks, we need to love the unlovable. We need to have the love of Christ inside of us. We need to listen to the Holy Spirit in our daily lives. And we need to obey God in the area of love. John 13. Look at John 13. John 13. Jesus is speaking here. John 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give you. Because see, even, you know, some will take the Old Testament and they'll, they'll quote the, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth type thing. Okay, and, and, and I understand that, but what he's saying, and when we study the, the Sermon on the Mounds, folks, he's going to give you seven illustrations of the world tells you this, but Jesus says this. And Jesus says this, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. What is a commandment? <laughs> That's not an option. Now, <laughs> I even heard people say, well, I love you, but I don't like you. I've got a problem with that statement, okay? All right, maybe I am different. Maybe we don't always agree, but folks, we need to love others in the way that Jesus loves others. I, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I loved you, that you love one another. Now look at this, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Boy, a phrase that just gets to me personally, and I haven't heard it lately, but when I hear it, oh, I'm just telling you, I'm just thinking, oh man, that is not good. I've heard this statement more than one time in my ministry in all three churches that I've been a part of. I heard someone say this, okay, you know, uh, as far as, you know, love, I don't have to love others. And I thought, yes, you do. And they even went as far, you know, in, in their minds and what they were saying and what they were trying to say. I, I was just caught back on that. And folks, we have to realize that God loves everyone and we need to love everyone also. Love. Uh, and, and folks, God's love is perfect. I know our love is not perfect, but God's love is perfect. And we need to be like Jesus when it comes to to love. The second thing I want you to see, not only a mind of love, but a mind of humility. A mind of humility. Look back in our text. Look at verse 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. And folks, I'm telling you, this is not the philosophy of the world. Everybody wants to be number one. Everybody wants to be waited on. Everybody seems to be entitled to things. And and here, uh, you know, Paul is writing and saying, folks, humility, that's what lowliness of mine is. We need more humble Christians in this world. Think of Jesus. He had the power to do anything he wanted to do. He had miracle power, folks, miracle power, but yet he never used that, that miracle power, uh, you know, to take advantage of people, okay? We need to be humble in all that we do, and Jesus was a great example of humility. Now look at verse 4, let, let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but for the interest of others. Oh, folks, our, our lives should be one of serving others. They use the word joy 
just uh, uh, in, in the second verse that we read. And here, here's what joy means, folks. Joy means Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. That's what joy is. Joy is being humble in all that we do. And, uh, you know, we just, we just have to understand the example that Jesus showed even his disciples. It was, it was just crazy kind of love and humility. Turn to John chapter 3 with me. I mean, John 13. We read from the last part of John, but let's look at the first part of John 13. We don't have time to go down through that, but you remember Jesus, you know, uh, was with, and it was Passion Week, and he was with his disciples. And he had, a, you know, a lesson, an illustration uh, that he wanted to show his disciples. So nobody, uh, you know, who was there, uh, the disciples, did what somebody should have done. And in tradition there, uh, when somebody came into your house, uh, you would take a basin of water and you'd take a towel and you would wash their feet. And that did not take place. So God was, all, I mean, Jesus was always teaching, teaching them lessons. And even as he started you know, you know, bathing the disciples' feet. He came to Peter, and Peter, you know how he is. He just speaks before he thinks. He said, you're not washing my feet. And Jesus said, hey, you know, you need to let me wash your feet. He just said, well, if you're going to wash my feet, why don't you just wash my whole body? I mean, Peter, Peter he, many times, folks, he engaged his mouth before he did his brain. All right? Jesus was trying to teach them a lesson. And let's uh, pick up in verse 12. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said unto them, do you know what I have done to you? Well, again, it's more of a rhetorical question. They just saw what he had done. Folks, what he did was what the lowest menial servant did. Okay? As far as the, the servant chain, that's the, the ones that washed the people's feet. And he did that. You are talking about the Son of God. You are talking about someone who was perfect. You are talking about someone that was going to give their life for others. But he saw this as an example to teach them the mind of humility. And folks, we have come, a lot of the epistles begin with the, the deal. James the bond servant of Jesus Christ. We are all bond servants, folks, in a spiritual uh, realm of things. We have come, we exist to serve others, and we need to be actively serving others. There's so many ways we can serve others. Then he said in verse 13, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, so for, for so am I. If then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. And you know what he's saying? Hey, if I say it's okay, if I'm giving you the example, this is exactly what you need to do. And I know what some people say, oh, I am. I'm not washing anybody's dirty feet. You know, one of the great ministries that I've seen going on is, in, I don't know the name of all of it, but it's where uh, churches buy kids' shoes. Have you seen that? And when they give them the shoes, they take their shoes off, they take their socks off, and they wash their feet, and they give them a, a new pair of socks and then give them a new pair of shoes. Folks, I am telling you, we are going to do something like that this fall. And that's what it means. Jesus is saying, hey, I did it and you need to do it also. Look at verse 15. For I have given you an example that you should uh, do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is no greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent them. What is he saying? He told many times in the Gospels, I and my Father are one. God has told me to wash your feet. God has told me to care for you. 
God has told me to see how I can serve you. And Jesus' life was an act of service. Verse 17, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Folks, true love is not only an attitude, it's in action. Everyday life, how can we serve others? How can we help others? It's so, so important. 1 Peter 5. Go with me to 1 Peter 5. 1 Peter 5, look in verse 5. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Folks, I learned this lesson in, you know, as I was growing up. My father knew what respect was. And my father made sure I had respect for all people that I come in t- contact with. If not, you know what? He waited till everything was over. We'd go in a back room somewhere and he would give me an attitude adjustment. Okay? Sometimes I'm just amazed. Uh, I was in a store, it's, it's been several months ago, and a kid and a mom was in the toy out, toy out. And she said, I am not buying you another toy. He said, I hate you. Fell on the ground and started crying. And I wanted to go down that aisle and say, ma'am, I'm the pastor of Rye Hill Baptist Church, and I can help you with this. If you'll just let me go, you can stand right outside the door, but if you'll take me to the bathroom like my dad has taken me to the bathroom, I'm telling you, next time it's not going to happen. And folks, I'm serious about this. That's one of the problems. Well, there's several problems about school. One is we took prayer out of school. Okay, one is we took the Bible out of school. One is we took corporal punishment out of school. There's nothing to threaten them with, all right? And throw time out out the door, all right? You let them go to their rooms and play with their toys during time out, okay? All right, I I feel like I'm better. I'm having therapy here, okay? I'm much better. There is no reason for young people to talk to their parents that way. And folks, we as grandparents, we need to correct them in love. But I'm just telling you, we can straighten them out. First Peter 5, likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you submit to one another and be clothed with humility. All right? Folks, clothing is what we have on. Every day we need to put on humility. Okay? Man, I'm just telling you, uh, you know, to have respect, it's just like being a preacher. Folks, there is never a time that I'm not a preacher. I don't care on my days off when when I'm on my Harley, I may not look like a preacher, (laughs) but I'm still a preacher. Everywhere we go, people are watching us, and we need to be humble in everyday life. Now, look at this. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Folks, I know we mess up, okay? We mess up, you know, even raising uh, our kids. You know, I was probably hard on Jonathan, and, uh, you know, I I just want to say I'm not making excuses, but, I, you know, a lot of times we parent by how we were parented. I'm not blaming my father, but I'm simply saying there was times after I would, and, and here's the key, folks, Do not discipline your children in anger. Don't do it. The Bible clearly speaks of that. Okay? You give yourself a timeout, and then you go back and you discipline them when you're not angry. And what true humility is, even in that case, uh, I, I had, you know, not very often, maybe one or two times, I had to tell Jonathan after I disciplined him that I was sorry. I shouldn't have been upset, and I shouldn't have done that. Folks, that's what humility is, folks. When we're wrong, let's say we're wrong, and let's go on. Verse 6, Therefore humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due times. 
The Bible says, humble ourselves. Let God do your talking for you. Not how uh, great you are. Casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. Now look at verse 8. This is so important. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfastly in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Folks, you know, we all go through times of suffering, okay? And, and you, you just have to understand, no matter what situation in life, no matter what challenge we have in life, we need to be humble and just like Jesus. So we see a mind of love, a mind of humility, and then a mind of obedience. Look back in our text, Philippians. Philippians 2. The Bible says, Let this mind be new, verse 5, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it to be a robbery or to be equal, consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and being come, being come in the likeness of men. Folks, what do you think it took Jesus? I, I'm just amazed at this. He left a perfect place. He left heaven, and he became a mere mortal man. Okay? And I understand, you know, the conception. I understand the Holy Spirit. But okay? I mean, he grew up, and hey, that's Joseph's son. Okay? I mean, he took on body form. And you know what that told me? And, and I believe this was all my heart, folks. If Jesus can do that, if Jesus and the Holy Spirit is inside of us, we can be that way too. We don't have to be arrogant. We don't have to be loud. We don't have to, you know, uh, control things all the time. We don't have to do these things that do not show humility in our lives. And that's what this verse is talking about. No reputation in the form of a bond servant. And folks, you could put in there slave. Okay, slave. And everybody in those days knew what a slave was. And we just need to understand that Jesus came down to earth and he was humble in all that he did. And we need to be humble also. So a mind of love, a mind of humility, and a mind of obedience. Look at verse 8. And being found in appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And folks, you think about what Jesus did in the trial time. I mean, they were accusing him of things. They had false witnesses. There were people lying in the court uh, saying Jesus, you know, Jesus did this and Jesus does that. They called him bells above, uh, Lord of the Flies. And even Pilate turned over and basically one time and just said, hey, you know, do you have nothing to say? And listen to me, folks, I can help you here today. There are times that it is better that you don't say something than to say what's on your mind. Folks, I've been around people that they said, you know, I'm going to give you a piece of my mind. And after they did, I thought, man, you're giving too much of that away. All right. Did you hear what you just said? Okay. And folks, we have to be careful in that. Jesus humbled himself and then he came, became obedient. All right. You think about it. When Jesus came to earth, he had one purpose in being there to die for you and i one purpose that's why he came is to die for us folks it takes you know a, a lot it takes a lot the perfect son of god to have the body of a man and to go through all that that trial and that cat of nine tails and that mockery and that beating 
all right, and die on a cross for us. But folks, He was that. He died on the cross for us. He was obeying His heavenly Father. Verse 9, Therefore God has also highly exalted Him and given Him the name which is above every name. Man, I love the name Jesus. I really do. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Sweetest name I know. Folks, I am telling you, if we could emulate Christ, if we could be humble, if we could show love, if we could be obedient, I wonder how much better this world would be if they, we all were just obedient to Christ. Obedient. Because here's what I found out, folks. It takes two to argue. If you don't go to the argument, they're arguing with themselves. Okay? And you have to understand, folks, there are times when it's better that we do not say a word. And I'll walk away from an angry man. If somebody calls me on the phone and starts yelling at me, I'll say, excuse me, when you can talk in a regular voice, we can have a conversation. Because, folks, there are just some people that they wake up mad. <laughs> they're just looking for a fight. They're just looking to, you know, they're, they're pushing buttons on you. And, folks, we meet, need to understand that in everything we do, we need to obey Jesus Christ. Verse 10, that at the same, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, those in heaven and those on earth and those under earth, and that every tongue should confess Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. You know what that's telling me? They will humble themselves one day. They'll either stand before God as saved and go on to heaven, or they will be condemned to hell, folks. And folks, nobody's escaping that. Everyone is going to stand before God. Everyone is going to give an account to God, and we need to understand that. So in practicality, okay, I want to challenge you to try something this week, okay? I, this is hard. I, I try this, I don't even, I don't want to put a number to it, but I try this, and folks, it may be one of the biggest challenges that I have in my Christian walk. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. In other words, you cannot use your flesh as an excuse. We all have flesh. We all have attitudes. We all need adjustments. We all need to keep, you know, order, keep and, and guard and watch. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Do you know what a stronghold is? That's a place that you may have surrendered it to God at one time, but it's still there. This rears its head up every now and then, and when it rears its head up, you fall most of the times. Satan hits us in our weak places, folks. He's looking for your weakness. And you, you, know, you don't need to tell him. It's, it's like telling him, you know, hey, sick me here. You know, I, you know, I don't like this person. Or I have you ever figured out that because you know you don't like that person, they seem to come around more often. <laughs> if you would get your attitude straight by that, it wouldn't matter if they came around, okay? But I'm telling you, Satan does this. He hits, hits your strongholds, casting down arguments and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Satan makes wrong right and right wrong. Folks, Satan wants you to say, hey, you can't do it. You start off the day and you may try, but you can't do this. Well, why don't we throw scripture at him? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Folks, it's so important that you throw scripture at Satan, okay? He hates hates scripture he hates jesus's name now here's the challenge bringing every thought into the captivity 
to the obedience of Christ. Wow. Every thought you think in a day's time comes under the obedience of Christ. What you'll find out is the more you make this, I mean, I, I have failed. I couldn't even tell you how many times. I'll start out the day and think, man, I'm rocking along. I'm doing good. And then somebody will press that button. And I'm not using that as an excuse. It's me. It's my choice. I'm the one that said it, or I'm the one that had an attitude. But folks, if we could get where every thought that we had came under the obedience of Christ, we would have the mind of Christ. And folks, that's a challenge. And I do. I, I challenge you to practice that this week. Father, thank you for the day. and God, I thank you for the Apostle Paul and just what a straight shooter he was. And God, I, I truly want the mind of Christ. And Lord, I pray that we would have that as a goal in our own lives. God, it was a mind of love. It was a mind of humility. And it was a mind of obedience. And God, I pray, Lord, this week we would practice those things in our lives. God, this world would be so much better. There wouldn't be hate. There wouldn't be disunity. There wouldn't be fights and problems. God, we can work out anything. Two people can get together and work out anything if we have the mind of Christ. So God, I pray that many in this building would take the challenge this week to have the mind of Christ, to react the way he would react, to say what He would say, to be in tune with this Heavenly Father, to be able to say, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. God, if there's one here today that doesn't know You, God, I pray that today would be their day of salvation. God, salvation is the greatest gift that we can receive. Salvation is the greatest gift that had ever been given. So God, if there's somebody here that doesn't know you and they don't have the assurance that if they died today, they would go to heaven, I pray they would come down and talk to us. God, we would share scripture with them. So God, this is your church or maybe somebody else needs to come for baptism. Maybe Christians need to rededicate their life. God, I pray if those uh, who have been here and know who we are and want to join, if, if it's time, Lord, I pray they would obey your voice. So God, this is your church. This is your invitation. And God, we pray, Lord, that we would all be obedient. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?